I am I'm sitting because I want to talk to you uh, from my heart this morning, and I want you all to be able to hear um, what I'm going to say with you and what we're going to share. We're going to switch gears and just go to a real uh, place that the Lord has on my heart that I want to begin a different uh, series this morning. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for you. We give our hearts to you, God. You are wonderful. You're gracious. You're mighty. You're kind. I just thank you for the expression of worship, God. It just sets a platform that it breaks barriers and it breaks through strongholds, God, and it sets us free and it paves the way for the word of God to go forth. So open our hearts as we go to your word this morning. Speak through me that I may speak clearly uh, to your people so we can be who you would have us to be. So we love you. We worship you. We bless your holy name. It is in your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. Amen. Let me, just, let me just start here by saying this. Go with me in your Bible to the book of Genesis number 1. Genesis chapter 41. Go to Genesis 41. Um, I'll be talking from that passage of scripture. And uh, while you're turning there, um, let me just say some things to you by way of um, an introduction this morning. And... Um, I, need, I, need, I just need you all to kind of hone in a little bit this morning, all right? If you can just grab. I want to talk, I, I talk about this whole interesting t- subject of what it means to flourish financially. Um, and I'm not saying that from the perspective of the ministry, but I want you to hear me through the lens of your perspective. I want to help you this morning. Is that all right? Yeah. Come on, come, come on, y'all say amen. Anybody want to be helped? Come on, anybody want to be helped this morning? I want to help you. I want to help you. I want to help you this morning, and I want to help myself um, as we kind of talk through this thing. And and let me just say this. I don't know about you, but um, working from the rear is challenging. What I mean by that, I want you all to hear this, and then we're going to go to the scripture. Um, When you're coming from a place where when you've never had anything, that when you In that place, you live, you dream, you wish I had, you wish all that good stuff, such that when we do get a chance to have a little of something, we ended up blowing it all on what we wish we never had. Come on, y'all. Am I talking to myself? I need a couple of amens this morning. Yeah, I mean, some of you are dreaming about, if if I were to ask the question this morning, if you were to have a million dollars, somebody were to give you a million dollars, what would you do with it right now, Right? I'm pretty sure you'd hear, man, I'd go do this, I'd do that, I'd do this, I'd do that. And, and why is that? Because you've never had a million dollars, and the moment you get it, all those dreams will become a reality. Am I talking to myself this morning? So here's what I want to say to you, and, and I want to follow this outline so I can, uh, and we'll be here for a little while to talk to this. I want to challenge you by start by saying this. Let today be the last day of your life that you ever find yourself being broke, living from paycheck to paycheck. I need, come on, I need a couple more. Come on, y'all. Come on. Can we say amen? 30 David said, neighbor, I don't know about you, but, but today's the last day. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I want to make some hard statement. I want you to make the decision today to begin, to begin investing into your financial future. I want you all to hear me say that. If you don't have an emergency account funded at $1,000, I want you to make the decision today to begin, right? And so if you're not debt-free, make the decision today to begin that process. I'm going to go as far as to say, even if you don't have a three-month income saved up, make the decision today to begin working on that. If you don't have a retirement fund, Make the decision today to begin the process of working on that. Here's a tough one. If you are living on 100% of your income, that means paycheck to paycheck, make the decision to stop. Can we say amen? I want to help you this morning. And I believe God's word has the truth. God's word has principles And some of us, sometimes we think that the Word of God is only about the spiritual man, but the Word of God is also about the physical man. Jesus did say, I come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And so what I want to do is today I want to begin a series of sermon that will begin the process of teaching us what it means to break 
those poverty, the poverty cycle that exists among us as a people of God. And I want to use God's word. I want to use God's, the Bible to show us principles, to show us stories that I'm saying to you that if we invoke them, we can get to the place where we flourish financially. I want, amen, come on. There is nothing wrong with that. Amen. Y'all are quiet now. There's nothing wrong with that. And so we're going to go through the word of God. It's going to be hard. It's going to be challenging. But it's going to press us to go to some different places. So today I, I want us to look at the story of, of Joseph. Here, here and, and what we're going to look at specifically in this story is Joseph's ascent to the throne in Egypt. I want to use some principles there to talk through that. So we can see how, what, how and what we need to do to become the people that God is calling us to do. Now, when you get to chapter 41, by just by way of a little bit of a literary context, understand with me that at the onset of chapter 41, Joseph was already sold into slavery in Egypt. Now, um, I'm going to back into this to give you a little bit more literary context, but I just want to go through here because I want to share a couple of principles with you. He had found himself, um, bought, he was bought by Potiphar. He found himself working in Potiphar's house. And here's the thing that you need to know. God prospered him while he was working in Potiphar's house. He found himself being tempted by Potiphar's wife. Potiphar's wife lied on him. He found himself in prison. Listen to this. In prison, he prospered. Amen. Then, while in prison, he ended up meeting this baker and a butler, and he interpreted the dream of both of them such that the butler was restored to his position and the baker lost his head. And so now, at the time of the text, the, but, the butler had been released. Two years has passed, and Joseph still finds himself in prison. And in the interim, the text picks up by saying Pharaoh had a dream. And in Pharaoh's dream, no one could interpret Pharaoh's dream. And then all of a sudden, the butler remembers this Hebrew boy that's in prison that knew how to interpret dreams. Um, Pharaoh summons him, and he comes now to the place where he is about to interpret um, Pharaoh's dream. So I want to pick this up, and I want to share four things with you. And before I even read the passage of Scripture, here's the first thing I want you all to take away. And we're going to review this next week. I want you to understand that wasteful spending always results in a famine. Guaranteed. Now, I know, I know it ain't a thousand of us in here, but if the truth is the truth, go ahead and say amen. All right? Wasteful spending always results in the famine. What do you mean, preacher? Keep spending, it's going to run out. And that's a lot of our problem, isn't it? Okay, so let's look at the text. Look at the text. I want to read. I'm going to do quite a bit of reading, and I'll kind of narrate along the way. So notice how it begins by saying, go down to verse 14, and let's talk about this so we can see what the good Lord is saying. Notice what it says. It says, Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph. This is after his dream. And they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in after Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. And here's what Pharaoh says. I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Notice what verse 16 said. Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Verse 17, then Pharaoh said to Joseph, behold, in my dream, listen to this now, I was standing on the banks of a Nile. Seven cows, plump and attractive, came up out of the Nile and fed in the reed grass. Verse 19 says, Seven other cows came up after them, poor and ugly and thin, such as I have never seen in all the land of Egypt. And the thin, ugly clouds, watch cows, ate up the first seven plump cows. And when they had eaten them, no one could, would have known that they had eaten them, Lord Jesus, for they were still as ugly as at the beginning. Then I woke. Verse 22 says, I also saw in my dream seven ears growing in one stalk, full and good. Seven ears withered, 
thin and blighted by the east wind sprouted after them. And the thin ear swallowed up the seven good ears, and I told it to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. Now look at verse 25. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed, it, has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. And it says the seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one. Come on, say the dream are one. Verse 27. Then it says the seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years. And the seven empty ears blighted by the east wind are also seven years of famine. And then look at verse 28. It is as I told Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Now, I know you all know this story quite well, but I want you to get in the, in the spirit. Here is God. God is about to do something in the world. God is about to do something in the atmospheric realm. And then interestingly enough, I find that he had positioned Joseph in a place to instruct the Pharaoh of Egypt what he is about to do. And then God does it through the dream. He does it through a dream where he reveals to Pharaoh what is about to take place. And then let me, let me read a couple of things that I want to walk through the text. Notice, notice, this, notice this statement I want to make before I even go into the text. Here's my problem and here's your problem. We need to get to the place where we stop buying things we don't need to impress people we don't like. All right? We need to stop buying things we don't need. Come on, y'all, let's be honest. To impress people we don't like. Here's what God is saying to Pharaoh. Hey, Pharaoh, I'm about to do something in the earth realm, and if you don't pay attention, you're going to find yourself in a famine. And the reason I'm, I'm bringing this out is because the people of God, the church of God, come on, not, I mean, even the world, but the people of God ought to be exempt from this. We always find ourselves in the famine because we don't pay attention to the warnings of God. For some reason, we've unplugged ourselves from the economic systems of the world and we don't pay attention to what's going on around us and we find ourselves just like this, spending, 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 spending and never having anything we need to be who God would have us to be. Most of you remember the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. Here's what the younger son did. He went to his father and he said, Daddy, give me that which is coming to me. And his father divided up the substance and he gave it to him. Now notice what happened. The son took his set of the resources and the first thing he did was he went out and he wasted his substance on riotous living. I like this. He bought a lot of things to impress people that he didn't even like. Okay? Because he wanted instant gratification and he ended up spending it on wasteful living. I don't know about you, but, but that, that was my problem. And I think I'm comfortable in saying for a lot of us as the people of God, that's our problem. We want to impress people when we come to church. <laughs> Can we be honest this morning? We want to impress the neighbor. We want to impress people when we go to work. We want to impress people when they see us out in public. And the scary thing about the statement that I'm about to make is the more we do it, the more we spend it, the more we are exasperating our resources. And what I want you to hear me say this morning is that wasteful spending positions us to be a victim of the famine. And we live paycheck to paycheck to paycheck. The text says, God was warning Pharaoh, there's going to be seven years of plenty, and then if you don't pay attention to the seven years of plenty, a time will come where the plenty will run out, and there will be seven years of famine. And if you have not prepared yourself while the plenty existed, the famine is guaranteed to get you. 
Come on, am I speaking truth this morning? Are you hearing me? Come on. Is everyone hearing me this morning? And here's what the scripture says in Amos 3, 7, right? God does nothing in the earth realm unless he first reveals it to his prophets. So I'm praying this morning that as we listen to this message, as we talk about through things financially, that we will get ourselves to the place where we prepare such that the famine will not have impact on us. Okay? So now notice the second thing. Wise investment, come on, repeat after me, say wise investments, it protects us from the famine. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, wise investments protects us from the famine. I'm going to go to some places that I'm going to challenge you to make a difference, right, to do some interesting thing. Look with me at verse 29. So he calls, he calls Joseph and Here's what I want y'all to hear about Joseph, right? Um, here's what we do. We, 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 we hear sermons about how Joseph made it from the pit to the palace and, and how Joseph was poor and then God blessed him. But I think what we miss and what we don't pay attention to that we're going to be talking about along the way is Joseph's process that qualified him to make it to the throne. That's the part that I think that we miss a lot when we walk through this. So look with me at verse 29, right? Notice he says, here's what um, he's saying. There will come, verse 29, seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. He's interpreting the dream, verse 30. But after them, it says, there will arise seven years of famine, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. You ever been so broke that you forgot how much money you used to make? <laughs> Come on, y'all. That's broke, isn't it? It says, the famine will consume the land, and the plenty will be unknown in the land by reason of the famine that will follow it. Uh, it will be very severe. And the doubling of Pharaoh's dreams mean that the thing is fixed by God, and God will surely bring it about. Let me show you some passages in the book of Proverbs where it kind of talks about this. Notice what Proverbs says. Proverbs 21 and 20. In the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil, but a foolish man does what? Devours what? All he has. Listen to what Proverbs 10 and 4 say. Lazy hands make a man poor, but diligent hands, does what? Brings wealth. Yeah, yeah. The prudency dangers, Proverbs 27 and 12 says, and take refuge, but the simple keep going and they suffer for it. This is the Bible, y'all. Look at Proverbs 21 and 5. The plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to what? Poverty. Now, I know you're not used to hearing this in church and particularly from me, but I want to say this as clearly as I can. God's design is that if we follow what he teaches us in Scripture, his intent is that we prosper by obeying his will, his word, and what he has, what he has in store for us. Okay? So don't miss the truth. Don't, don't miss the truth. Okay, I'm going to say one more time. Then I'm going to go to the third thing I want to talk about. Number one, wise investment, it does what? It protects us from the famine. So now, notice this next truth, and then we're going to talk. Okay? So then, wise investments now... It begins with the principle of the fifth. And I want to work here for a little while. Come on, say the principle of the fifth. Say it again. Say the principle of the fifth. If you don't, if you don't walk out of here with nothing else that I say to you this morning, I want you to get this passage out and understand the principle of the fifth. Let me tell you all a couple of stories. Um, I'm, I, I am a product of the corporate world, meaning I came out of the corporate world. And, and I started out, I think I was 20, maybe 25, when I received my first engineering job from IBM. Now, here is how the corporate world works, just so you can kind of get a feel. When I graduated from college, I applied for work in the corporate world, and normally back in the day when, when a company hires, they would hire a group of engineers together, and they would put them through a training process. Part of the hiring process, a part of your salary plan, was um, negotiating stock options um, to be a part of the company. Now, from where I come from, I didn't know what stocks were. Can I be honest? Come on, y'all. Can I be? Y'all go ahead and say amen. Where I'm coming from, I didn't know what stocks were, okay? So 
I go to work, and two friends, fellow engineers that I became very, very close with, one's name was Daniel Liu, an Asian guy, and the other's name was Shahan Dahanaika. I will never forget those two names as long as we live. Shahan was a South African guy of Indian descent. Here's what our work day would look like. We would go to work every morning, and I would go to my desk, and I would start designing. Here's what Daniel and Shahan would do every morning. They would pull up their computer and take the first 10 minutes looking at the stock market. That's what they did. And they would be blam, 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 blam. And then they would walk by my desk and say, made some money today. That's what they'd say, right? And so one day, I conjured up the guts to ask that man because I was too embarrassed to say, I don't know what stocks are. So one day, one day, one day, Daniel said to me, hey, man, I'm preparing to get out of here. I'm like, what do you mean? We just got hired. We got 30 to go. That means 30 years with the company. He says, no, nah, but that's not my plan. That's what he said. Shahan said the same thing, okay? So I kid you not, 10 years after working with the company, both Daniel and Shahan came by my desk and says, hey, Felix, we're quitting tomorrow. I'm like, what do you mean quitting tomorrow? We're done. We don't have to work anymore in our life. I'm like, what do you mean? Danny says, I'm going to L.A. I'm going to open a restaurant. Shahan says, I'm going back to the beach in South Africa. <laughs> what are you guys going to do? Enjoy life. So what, you, what did I miss? You kind of get where I'm going. While I was busy spending, they were busy investing. Ah, come on. They weren't working for money. They were making money work for them. I wish I had somebody in here. Come on. And so, and so, and so here's, what, here's what Danny does. He, he Facebooks me from now and time, from time and time again, and says, hey, man, what are you doing? And, uh, you know, I, I think it took me the next 10 years to figure it out. You kind of get where I'm going. And then once I figured out what they were doing, guess what I did? Joined up. Yeah, there you go. You kind of get it right now. You get, you get the idea. So when I was able to leave IBM a few years later, I went back to Sun Microsystem, and it became op time to negotiate those stock options. Guess who understood what stock were? Yeah, you get it. You kind of get what I'm saying? Guess who understood how to negotiate stocks? Guess who, when they went to work, spend the first few minutes of the morning looking at what? Come on, I want you all to hear me this morning because I figured some things out and I was not going to get caught in that same cycle all over again. So I want to show you Joseph's stock plan for Egypt and I'm hoping you learn the same thing to begin the process of changing life around. So notice, notice, notice now verse 33. Understand with me, a famine is coming. A famine is coming. Let me say this as simple as I can because I want you all to get this. The famine is coming, and Joseph said, I'm guaranteeing you the famine is going to come because God said it. So in other words, in the seven years of plenty, if you don't position yourself for the seven year of lack, the famine is going to get you. My problem is I fool myself into thinking that I'll always have income. And I think we, we all make the mistake, same mistakes. So, so notice this. <laughs> Let me read it before I read the text. The rich invest their money and spend what is left. The poor spend their money and they invest what is left. I want you all to process that statement for a while. It might not make sense. Tonight at 12 o'clock is going to go off in your head. Right? The rich invest their money, and then the residual they spend. Poor, here's what we do. We spend our money, and then the rest we try to invest. Think through that for a little while. I'll flesh it out in the upcoming weeks. So notice verse, say verse 33. Everybody watch this. Everybody watch this. Now therefore, Joseph said, let Pharaoh select a deserting and wise man, and set him over the land of Egypt. And he said, let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers 
over the land, and here we go, and take one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years, and let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming, and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities, and let them keep it. That food, he says, shall be a reserve. Come on, say a reserve. Come on, say again, a reserve. A reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to occur in the land of Egypt so that the land may not perish through the famine. My goodness, this is exciting stuff. We're going to talk about this in the upcoming week. You see, Joseph understood some things. Let me just go here. He understood some things that when he found himself in Potiphar's house, he invoked the same investment principles. And listen to what the scripture says when you read it. It says, God blessed Potiphar's house because of Pharaoh. And then when, I mean Potiphar, because of Joseph. And when Potiphar saw how God was blessing his house because of Joseph, he put Joseph in charge of everything inclusive of his food. Then he goes to prison and he invokes the same principle that he knows how God works in prison. And it says, and everything Joseph touched in prison prospered. Come on, I want you to hear me. Then um, Pharaoh now finds himself in a predicament and then he, there's going to be the seven years of plenty and seven years of lack. And all Joseph does is he does what he knows to do. And God blesses. Okay. So, so, so he invokes, he invokes what I'm going to refer to. Wise investment begins with the principle of the fifth. Come on, say the principle of the fifth. We're going to talk about this more. Here's what the principle of the fifth is. I hope y'all can see this. Here's the principle of the fifth. And if you were to do the math and take one-fifth of a hundred, you get 20, correct? So, say 20%. I want to talk candidly. Say 20%. So here's what he did. Number one, Pharaoh, whatever we do in the next seven years, never live on 100% of our income. Whatever you do, Pharaoh, don't do it. Okay, where are you getting that, preacher? Notice what it says in verse 34. Let the Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven years of plentiful and gather them all the and gather all the food, those good years that are coming, and do what? Store up grain. Store up grain. So the second principle of the fifth says this: if we're not going to live on 100 percent of our income, develop and live on a budget. Don't raise your hand. How many of us in here have a budget that we follow? Yeah, yeah. You kind of get it. You can't, don't raise your hand, but you get it, right? Think about it for a while, okay? And then you take, so you grow to the point when you have a budget to live, I say maximum, you can do more, of 80% of your net income, and then you allot 20% of your net income for investment purposes, Hear me out. And here's how I break down the 20%. You grow, you grow, you grow. You grow to the place where God gets 10, and you grow to the place where you save 10. So hear me out carefully, church, and we'll flesh this out some more next week. Principle of the fifth, meaning the 80-20 rule, right? If you're living on 100% of your income, you'll never be able to get ahead of, of life. And you'll always be working from the rear. And if you're not saving or investing, you're not positioning yourself for a strong and a healthy financial future. And the famine is going to get you. Does this make sense? Come on, say amen. Does this make sense? Come on, y'all, come on, y'all talk to me. Come on, say this. I, I want to help us. I want, now, I know this is hard. I know this is tough. One more time. Repeat after me. Say, self, yeah. never. Live on 100% of your income. Come on, tell your other neighbor. Say, neighbor, don't live on 100% of your income. Okay? Now, here it is. 
If you don't have a budget, get one. 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 And the purpose for the budget is to begin the process of turning things around. Now, I'm going to move. Let me move because we're going to pick this up in the upcoming weeks, okay? So notice the next thing. So if you are financially unable, okay, to invoke the principle of the fifth, you exercise one of two options. That means right now, okay, pastor, that sounds good, but I'm not there. It's okay. I got you. All right? You got to do one of two options. Here's what you got to do. Downsize if you have to. I'm going to wait for a moment till that settle in. All right? Quit making that huge car payment you can't afford. Get you a hoop tee. <laughs> Quit impressing people you don't like. Come on, is this making sense, right? Sell everything except the children. Y'all think I'm kidding. <laughs> Here's how Dave Ramsey says it, right? Live like no one else so you can do what? Live like no one else, okay? Now, I'm not saying this to be to brag or to say anything like that, but Katani and I are at a place where we don't have debt, right? The only debt we have is our mortgage. And to get there, we had to make the decision to live like no one else so we can get to the place where we live like no one else. Now here, this church is 20 years old, right? And in the latter part of the, the, the history of the church, you guys noticed that pastor took up scuba diving, pastor goes travel, Katani travels with me. We do a lot of that, right? But don't forget, there were a whole lot of years where we weren't doing none of that. We were working on something. All right? Living like no one else. He, he, here's, what, here's what people say to me. I'm, I'm saying this to kind of help you out. People say, well, you drive a BMW. So, no, no, no. That's an old Beamer. It just looks new. Because it's been paid off a long, 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 long time ago. And I don't need to impress you with a new one. I wish I had somebody. I just keep washing it and polishing it. And, and when it goes out, here's how I'm going. I'm not going to go get me a brand new one. No, no, no. I'm going to get me another one that I can pay cash for. Y'all, come because I refuse to go back into the place where I'm positioned for the famine. So I don't have no problem downsizing if I have to. And then here's the other thing that a lot of us wrestle with. If, if you can't, if you're unable to invoke the principle of the fifth, sometimes you have to create an additional income stream. That means like a second job. <laughs> In the streets, they call it hustle. <laughs> don't do this I'm praying for the Lord to provide and God's saying I'm waiting for you to get a job I'm being serious the principle of the fifth okay if you're not there there's strategies to begin the process to get there and then we're going to relive this and go over this again because I want us to all get this in our heart and in our spirit. So here's the thing. Whatever you do today, do not continue your current spending pattern as you are positioning yourself to be consumed by the famine. I'll say it over and over and over again. Stop it. Okay? Make sure we stop it. Let me read this next one and I'm going to go to my last point and then we're going to walk through this to get to where we need to go. Watch this. Thing. Money moves from those who do not manage it to those who do. I'm telling you, it moves from those who do not manage it to those who do. What are you saying, preacher? There's a saying that goes, if all the millionaires of the world gave an equal distribution of their resources the people don't have, given enough time, the millionaire is going to get their money back because they manage how they make it, and we don't manage how we spend it. Kind of get what I'm saying? Does this make sense? I'll talk more about that. So here, here and we're going to flesh this out. Here's the last thing I want you to say. Identify a wise budget manager to manage your finances. 
Okay? So let's read. Let's read this, and then, then I'm going to be I'm going to be done here. It says, this proposal, look at verse 37. This proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to all his servants, can we find a man like this? In whom is the Spirit of God? Oh, my goodness. This is a secular person now referring to a person who knows God as one who has the Spirit of God in him. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has shown you all this. Oh, my goodness. I hope we're not missing this. Since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and as wise as you. Watch what Pharaoh says. Verse 40, you will be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set over you all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck and made him ride in the second chariot and they called out before him and they called out before him bow the knee thus he said over all the land of Egypt moreover Pharaoh said to Joseph I am Pharaoh and watch this and without your consent no one shall lift up hand or foot in all the land let me say it again verse 44 Pharaoh now says to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no one should lift up a hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Read one more time. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no one will lift up a hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Let me show you this and tell you why I read that all the time and give you an illustration. Decide in your home who will become the budget manager in charge of all financial affairs. The budget manager, number one, should be the most spiritually discerning. Secondly, the budget manager is not necessarily the head of the household. Shekabashata. Here's what Pharaoh said. I'm not the budget manager. And this is what he said. I refuse. I'm Pharaoh. And I'm not going to spend anything unless I get your permission, Joseph. And I'm Pharaoh. Why was he saying that? Because he listened to the Spirit of God and wanted to position himself so he is not a victim of the famine, right? Look at the last one, look at the last one. The budget manager, every, everyone in the home, including the head of household, must. Here is Katani and Mike's problem in our earlier life. Felix had a bad spending problem. I did. I like stuff. Some of y'all like stuff too. Come on, y'all. Can I be honest? I did. I did. I like stuff, and then I didn't like paying for stuff. <laughs> Bad budget management, right? You kind of get what I'm saying? I, <laughs> I think I shared with you all a few years ago the story I had where one morning I got up and I got outside to go to work looking for my car, and the car was gone. Y'all remember that story? Yeah, and I called the cops. Somebody done stole my car. And they said, yeah, the repo man stole your car because you didn't pay for it, right? And the, the stupid thing about the story is not like we didn't have the resources. The money is sitting there. It's just I'm a bad budget manager. And so for us to turn our life around, Kitani was in the banking industry. She's a banker. So here's the decision we made. Hey, Katani, it's obvious that the Spirit of the Lord is in you. It's obvious that you know how to manage finances. It's obvious that you know how to manage resources. So here's what's going to happen. We're going to put you in charge of the resources, and I refuse to spend without your permission. Boy, was that difficult. I was twitching. Just wasn't working right. I passed by the suit store, and I'd be like... You know, I mean, I just had, I need to go to counseling. It just wasn't working right. Amen. But for seven years, come on, you to hear me. We had to invoke the principle of the fifth. And if I wanted to turn things around, I had to abide by the rule. It was hard. Remember my cancer episode? The reason we're able to survive that financially. Ah. We invoked the principle of the fifth. So when the famine came, notice you didn't see my wife running around, begging, panicking, struggling, trying to figure out what we was going to do. We prepared for the famine. Amen. Come on, y'all. Come on. Amen. Prepared for the famine. So here's what I want to say, and then we're going to stop, then I'm done. 
because I need you all to, to really take this to heart. Applications. Here's what I need you to do. Commit to the principle of the fifth or the 80-20 rule today. So you have to commit never, never, never beginning today to live on 100% of your income. Develop a monthly budget. And I like this. Spend your money on paper before you get it. Think about that. Okay, I'm going to make $100 this week. How am I going to spend it? Okay, take, if you can afford it, if you can afford it, if you can afford it, 20% is over here. Now, let me, how am I going to handle this 80? If you can afford it. If you can't afford that, okay, maybe I can, I have to live on 99.998%. Okay. It's okay. It's a start. You can't, amen. It's a start. Are you hearing me? Okay. It's a start. So, so I'm going to make $100. Well, Lord, you're going to help me because all I can save is a penny. It's a start. Because here's what you can do. You can walk around. I don't live on 100% of my income. Don't worry about how much I save. I'm beginning. <laughs> Next week, you're going to have two pennies. Come on, are you hearing me this morning? Begin somewhere. Don't fool yourself into thinking that we began at the 80%. No, 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 no. I think I'm excited to say that today that Katani and I live on a less than 80% of our income, but we didn't start there. We did not begin there. We were living on 110%. You know what that means? I mean, robbing Peter. Yeah. This week we can't pay the cable bill because we spent that money. I think some of us can identify with that, right? Start saving now and then start giving to God now. The principle in all of this is you've got to commit to grow and you have to commit to begin. We're going to flesh this out later. Commit to grow and commit to begin. Commit to grow and commit to begin. Turn the madness around. Hey, Pharaoh, there's a famine coming. God has some principles in place. 80-20 rule. Take 20% of what we get, Pharaoh, and store it up for seven years. Man, I did some math. I did some math. I entered the corporate world at 25, and I said to myself, if, if I had invoked this at 25, I'd be a millionaire times over. I think some of you would too. Come on, y'all. Come on. Right? Saving 20% of your funds. Just try it for seven years. And my challenge is going to be by the end of this series that every person here is going to have a seven-year plan to grow to the place of getting, putting 10% of their income away. And I want to show you what God's going to do in your bank account. I want to show you what God's going to do. He said to Pharaoh twice, hey, Pharaoh, God's going to do this. God's going to do this. God's going to do this. And Pharaoh said to him, it's obvious that the spirit of the Lord is in you because everywhere you go, you turn things around. And I want to share with you from God's word how we can turn things around. Can we do it, y'all? Come on, can we do it? Can we do it? Can we do it? Okay. Come on, worship team. Here's your action step. The next paycheck, you figure out how much you're going to put aside, but you're going to begin somewhere. Begin somewhere and start investing in your financial future that God would move and have his way and that God would be God in our midst. Bow your heads with me. Holy Spirit, you're a wonderful God. You're an awesome, you're a phenomenal God, and you're working in our lives, Lord. So we thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for who you are. There's truth in your scripture, and sometimes we miss it. Sometimes we miss what you're doing, Lord, and sometimes we get caught up in all the other stuff that we miss who you are. So as we continue to look at scripture, God, and talk about flourishing financially, your word is there to bless people, God. So help us to stop eating seed and start investing, God, into our future. So... Whoever's here, whoever's watching online, wherever we find ourselves, Holy Spirit, speak, speak candidly to us as we give ourselves to you.